Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong. Together, these four, the Four Tigers, led the way in making prosperity for its residents. Each of the Four Tigers had deep roots in electronic assembly and industry. That means assembling components into finished goods for export. For first few decades, the Tigers got off to a certain level of prosperity on the back of this industry. As the 70s came around, though, it became clear that this industry could not last. Manufacturers were decamping for cheaper places abroad. South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore managed to upscale their efforts and ascend the value chain. But Hong Kong managed neither, and they got left behind. This has had consequences that last to this present day. In this video, I want to talk about the fall of Hong Kong's electronics industry and how it missed the chance to grow in semiconductors. But first, I want to take the time to ask you to subscribe to the Asianometry newsletter. Yes, once more. I'm working on a newsletter that goes back to the Malaysian New Economic Plan. The NEP was one of the most radical policies of income and wealth reform in the world, and I've looked at a few. I think in this age of economic disparity, it is worth coming back to when considering, as we move to implement new policies, in America at least, to dissipate this inequality. You can find the link to the newsletter in the video description below, or you can just go to asianometry.com. You can expect a new newsletter every four days at 1 a.m. Taiwan time. Much thanks. Now back to the show. Hong Kong's economy started off as a shipping node connecting China and the rest of the world. British exports to China, like opium, would enter the country here. But after the Communist Revolution, China closed itself off from exports from the West. Furthermore, Chinese support of the Korean War led to an American embargo of goods to China. Hong Kong needed to remake itself. It found its way with two critical goods, textiles and electronics. Shanghainese textile barons, long seeing the Guomindan's end on the mainland, made their way to Hong Kong and set up shop there. At around the same time, Japanese companies like Sony began globalizing their supply chains. Hong Kong offered a cheap place to assemble their radio and television products. By the early 1960s, Hong Kong was the single biggest manufacturer in the developing world. Building on top of cheap labor, liberal trade relations, and a growing consumer culture abroad, Hong Kongers got rich. The Hong Kong textile industry did not last long, and rising labor costs caused them to leave for finer grounds elsewhere. Electronics industrial assembly began to dominate the Hong Kong economy. For a long time, Hong Kong assumed a role like what China has today, the workshop for the world's gadgets. Radio assembly, something that began in Sony in 1959, would lead to televisions and calculators. Fairchild Semiconductors, the American semi-maker, moved its electronics assembly work to Hong Kong. Motorola and National Semiconductor soon followed. Motorola, especially, would be a critical multinational corporation jumping off point for Hong Kong's future semiconductor industry. It would give Hong Kong that rare opportunity to acquire foreign technology. This is a familiar story. Taiwan, South Korea, and Singapore followed the same line as well. But Hong Kong was first. As late as the 1980s, Hong Kong's industrial economy could be judged to be far ahead in terms of technical sophistication and industry employment as compared to other countries like Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan. Things seem good. But if you know the story, then you know what is coming up next. I talked about this in my two videos about Singapore and Taiwan. For companies and economies who initially compete on the idea that they are quote-unquote cheaper, there is always another cheaper labor supply somewhere else. Very soon, your buyers are going to go abroad, leaving you with nothing. In order to defeat this challenge, companies need to do two things, both of which involve ascending the value chain. First, you can either ascend by creating your own consumer name brand and going directly to the consumer. This is the approach that South Korea went with Samsung, LG, and Hyundai, what China is doing with Huawei and Xiaomi. You win the ability to dictate your own prices and directly control the consumer relationship. Or secondly, you upgrade your own offering and create a more sophisticated technical solution. For Taiwan and Singapore, that meant going into the semiconductor foundry industry. This is cutting edge, extremely complicated stuff that hopefully only you can do. What you control here is the ultra-special technology to make it. 
Hong Kong failed to do either of those things. As a result, its electronics industry lost its industry, and the scar that is left continues to throb to this day. Now, I think everyone wants to assign blame to something somewhere, and I get it. It's part of the human coping process. It helps to have a solid thing that you can point to. But I also want to say before we embark on this section that success is never preordained. In fact, failure is more likely than not. Most things don't work out. It makes me wonder why we spend so much time looking at when things do work out. We would probably learn more by looking at the opposite. But just think about that, okay? All right, here we go. Let us start with the big event, the founding of TSMC in early 1987. TSMC's independent foundry model would crack apart the old integrated semiconductor industry and from then onwards put them on two parallel paths. On one half, you have the foundries, providing the industrial work of fabbing the chips. This is a tough path that requires government-scale resources and military-style execution. Taiwan, South Korea, and Singapore embarked down this path, bringing hefty government-backed budgets with them to the fray. The Hong Kong government did not encourage the growth of R&D-led industrial upgrading within the electronics industry, and especially not towards foundries. But for a number of reasons, let's talk about them. One part has to do with the fact that Hong Kong was a colony beholden to the United Kingdom. There's a lot to explore here in terms of relationship between colonizer and colony, perhaps for a future video. But the relationship is that Hong Kong's fiscal hands were somewhat tied. The United Kingdom's own difficult fiscal situation post-World War II constrained its colony. Perhaps because of this, or for other reasons, like perhaps the educational background of its leaders, the Hong Kong government adopted a fiscally conservative industrial policy that emphasized the general macroeconomy. They took the stance that their administration should not pick winners or losers. They did not offer tax incentives, for example, to individual companies. They instead focused on providing resources for basic needs like transportation, MTR, public housing, and healthcare. And for the most part, they did this quite well. A lack of industrial manufacturer representation in the Hong Kong Legislative Council meant that Hong Kong policy never took coherent, aligned direction towards encouraging R&D upgrading to save the industry. Dominated by financial and trading interests, policy was steered towards free trade, a low profit tax, and a smaller state. Larger geopolitical concerns also loomed over the multinational manufacturers as well. A foundry costs a lot of money. You're investing hundreds of millions, and it can take years to recoup the investment. Political concerns surrounding the handover did have some influence here. But I do want to add that they are secondary, and had the administration wanted to, they could have been addressed. Larger than all of that was a land problem, as is always the case in Hong Kong. Some arms of the Hong Kong government tried to provide land to help keep industrial factories from leaving. And there are a few areas that now exist. The industrial estates in Taipo, Yuan Long, and Chen Wukuan O are notable. I probably messed up those. I'm not Cantonese. But at the same time, there's no denying that the Hong Kong government as a whole pushed land prices higher and higher because that was how they made money. Sometime in the 20th century, the Hong Kong government found itself generating the majority of its revenues from land sales rather than taxes. Manufacturers already struggling to compete against foreign competition suffered not only from a rising cost of labor, but also surging land rents. Thus, the Hong Kong electronics assembly industry died. Companies packed up and moved elsewhere, mostly to China. All that was left were the knowledge-based functions like sales, consultation, account management, and marketing. Manufacturing employment collapsed. Huge numbers of workers were laid off. Hong Kongers have felt the consequences of this blue-collar collapse ever since. The other half of the semiconductor industry would be that of the fabulous semiconductor makers. They design the chips that the foundries make. They manage the customer relationship. These include Qualcomm, MediaTek, NVIDIA, and now Apple. And actually, I would say that these fabulous semiconductor makers, to be a designer of such chips, is much more profitable. Countries with a pool of highly educated engineers with an entrepreneurial kick, the US, UK, Japan, They might not be able to build and host semiconductor foundries, but can host the companies that those foundries might make chips for. It is possible that Hong Kong could have grown a company like Qualcomm or NVIDIA, and for a few years it seemed possible. The Hong Kong fabulous semi-space held a lead over their rivals in Taiwan and South Korea. Hong Kong's location in the heart of the consumer electronic supply chain gave it a head start. 
Furthermore, many highly educated engineers lived in Hong Kong. It offered a pool of talent for multinationals to tap. Motorola's Hong Kong division in the early 1990s was very strong in microprocessor design. They even took the lead in developing the company's Dragon Ball microprocessor series. Motorola's presence offered the chance to seed an entire industry. Hong Kong even had a homegrown champion of their own, Valence Semiconductor. Founded in 1985, Valence began by offering layout design services to foreign companies like Fujitsu and NEC. They then grew into designing entire systems for their customers, with their chips finding their way into many popular consumer products. I actually, I, I've read actually that some of their chips went into the PlayStation, but I wasn't able to find proof or backing of that claim. Uh, still need to keep looking. This all faded away, however. Valance was a standout, but the rest of the Hong Kong semi industry did not have the technical chops to reach escape velocity. Lacking sufficient know how, investment capital, and government support, the industry weathered away. Motorola decamped, scaling back their design center in Hong Kong and moving operations to Suzhou, Shanghai, and Beijing. While they did spin off a few smaller design shops before they left, on Semiconductor and Solomon Systech are notables. These tiny shops are nowhere large enough to train and sustain a semiconductor design ecosystem. Talented young engineers would end up going abroad to find well-paying work. Other countries began offering attractive deals to bring multinational corporations to their shores. Singapore and China are especially great at doing this, but India and even Taiwan competed too. Motorola management asked Francis Ho, Secretary of Commerce and Economic Development at the time, for state support in 2002 to stay in Hong Kong, but was turned down, so they left. Singapore's officials like to emphasize the global competition for talents. To me, the lesson of Hong Kong's electronics industry is that no administration should take the current highlights of its economy for granted. In a way, I understand the administration's actions. They believed in a philosophy that supported the macroeconomy as a whole, as I emphasize. The administration provides the market building blocks and the market takes care of the rest. And I think such a philosophy definitely can achieve success when it comes to certain industrial policy goals. But maybe the electronics and semiconductor industries just will require more involvement than others. Your competitor governments are highly involved, offering market distorting incentives to steal away customers, companies, and more. Thus, your own administration needs to get involved. If every other kid at your kid's school are getting private lessons from their parents after class, then you are going to need to do the same with your kids if you want them to stay ahead of the curve. There is an assumption that economies naturally adjust over time to industry declines. Hong Kong lost its electronics industry but gained, quote unquote, a vibrant finance and services industry. The latter rising has the former declined. But I feel like Hong Kong's general deindustrialization has had costly human consequences for itself and its people. It was a loss of a big tax base for the government and for the people who lost their jobs. They became losers who stayed lost over time. All right, everyone, take care of yourselves out there. If you want to support also the Asianometry channel, make sure to like and subscribe. Um, I have a lot more other content coming out. So take care of yourselves out there. See you soon.